Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to the second session of SNUFA after this break. Our first speaker of the session is Christian Machet. He's a PI at the Champelimo Center in Lisbon, and he has a very impressive background in computational neuroscience with uh, group leader positions previously also in Munich and Paris. And in his research, he's interested in, um, in uh, various uh, brain areas in neural populations and um, animal species. And he um, combines data analysis with computational modelings. And today we hear about computing with spikes in, as a geometric approach in spike neural networks. I'm looking forward to your talk. OK, thanks, Julia, for the nice introduction. And thanks for the organizers for the invitation and opportunity to give uh, present uh, our work. Um, so I'm going to talk about computing with spikes, a geometric approach to spiking neural networks. And before I start, I just want to briefly acknowledge uh, the people uh, who have worked with uh, on this topic. So most of all, William Podlaski, um, who's also going to be luckily the uh, speaker right after me. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about his work, but it's also based on older work by Nuno Kalaim, Sander Keming, Alan Mancou, Guillermo Martin, and also some newer work applications by Carolina Heimer. Okay, so let's first start by thinking about computation in neural networks. So I would argue that the most popular paradigm these days is the following to perform any kind of computation. So first of all, we define some function, something that we want to compute. It could just be something like, you know, uh, images mapped onto labels, for instance. Then we define a network, such as a feedforward network or a recurrent network. And then we optimize the parameters, usually the synaptic weights, via gradient descent. Um, and of course, we do that both in AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, but also in biology. But what about all the details that we know about in neural circuits? What about, for instance, the fact that there are many different cell types? Uh, something that Karim talked about earlier, for instance, excitatory versus inhibitory. What about the wiring diagrams, some of which are known now, such as Drosophila in the fly? What about these single cell features, um, that there's different types of uh, dynamics in single cells? Well, one possibility would be to just say, OK, we're going to take these all as so-called biological constraints and put them in our definition of the network and then just exactly follow through this optimization approach. Now. That is a very pragmatic approach. It's a very application-oriented approach. And it's heavy on numerics in some sense. And maybe that's all we need, depend on what we want to do. But what it, of course, doesn't necessarily give us is any kind of understanding what is going on. So for instance, if we introduce all these biological constraints as constraints into the network, then we don't really understand what they mean. We don't understand why they're excited or inhibitory subtypes why the system is wired in a particular way, why single neurons have particular features and all that kind of stuff. So what do we understand about neural networks? Well, in some sense, we can say there's a large class, a space of neural networks. And in that giant space of neural networks, there are sort of a few islands of understanding that we have. So one of them, I would argue, are feedforward networks. So feedforward networks are probably the best understood networks. Of course, I acknowledge I'm talking to people interested in spiking networks and feedforward networks are you know, generally rate networks, but they can also be spiking networks. So in a feedforward network, each neuron is a feature detector and we can uh, arrange them in layers and then we have a hierarchy of layers. And so we understand, you know, what the single neuron does. We understand what the layer does. We don't understand everything in a feedforward network either, but you have a pretty good understanding of feedforward networks. Um, then there are some iconic recurrent networks that we understand very well. For instance, the Hopfield network, which has been investigated in great detail. We now take all architectures, ring attractors, balanced networks, etc. So there are some networks where we can say we have a good understanding of them. In these networks, we don't really know necessarily what the single neuron does. It's really more about the collective dynamics, the interaction of the different neurons that tells us something about what the network is doing. So what I want to talk about today is that I think we can do more. We can understand more networks. I think there's a way of understanding computations in quite a large class of spiking recurrent neural networks and also understand the role of each of the neurons in these networks. 
And then hopefully through understanding, you know, we'll be able to manipulate them better, get better applications eventually, but also understand neural circuits in biology much better. Okay, that's a that's a bold claim. So I hope I got everyone's interest. <clears throat> so let me start though somewhere else. Let me start with the way we analyze neural data these days. So of course we can analyze a lot of data these days. Uh, we can record from many, many neurons. Um, and <clears throat> the way we usually analyze the data is by taking the spike trains of a population of neurons and for instance, taking the spike count of all of these neurons and embedding them in a state space, which is shown here. So you have the firing rate, for instance, of firing rate of neuron one, the firing rate of neuron two, the firing rate of neuron three. This dot would be the state of the network in a particular point in time. And then you sort of see as it evolves over time, the activity of this population traces out a particular trajectory in that state space. Now, through many experiments in the past, in various areas of the brain, we've usually found that these activities lie in a lower dimensional subspace of the original firing rate state space. Um, and these subspaces are simply found by basically taking the vector of firing rates, R, projecting them through some kind of decoding matrix D, and then observing a new coordinate system Y, which I'm gonna call the latent space, so some type of latent variables, that basically tell us what the activity of a population is uh, is doing. And the idea in system neuroscience these days is that in fact, to understand how computations in real biological circuits work, is we need to understand the dynamics in these latent spaces and understand computations in these latent spaces. So it's not the original state space that really tells us what's going on, it's sort of this projected activity in this latent space that tells us what's actually going on in a neural network. And that of course is a very uh, phenomenological description of what happens in neural networks, but there's also a simple way of thinking about what that means for the underlying network. So in the underlying network, if we have a recurrent network with a weight matrix W um, and a bunch of neurons that are shown here, then there's a simple constraint that we can put on this weight matrix to get exactly this phenomenology. We simply have to assume that the weight matrix W is low rank, so that it factorizes into two rectangular matrices E and D. And if we assume that, then we automatically obtain exactly this property that any kind of dynamics in the original state space will fall into some kind of lower dimensional subspace, which we call, can call this latent space. Now this observation goes back to some work by Sebastian Sjung already 20 years ago, but also work on the neural engineering framework by Chris Smith and Charlie Anderson, and more recent work by Francesca Mastro Giuseppe and uh, Sergeon Ostrichitz. If we, and here's, so for those of you who are less familiar with this idea of low rank, here's maybe the, the way you can think about what a network like that is doing. So a low rank network. So imagine for instance, that we have exactly the same network, but an alternative way of looking at it. In this alternative way, the activity of these neurons, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, is first read out through some kind of decoding matrix D into these latent units Y1 and Y2. These are really virtual units. They don't really exist in the network. Just think of them as kind of virtual units. And these units Y1, Y2 then project back through some kind of encoder matrix E into the actual uh, neurons R1, R2, R3, etc. So this is a way just to visualize the effect of a low rank matrix in a neural network. It gives rise to this bottleneck and this bottleneck Y1, Y2, that is the latent space. And now our key idea is that we can actually understand the dynamics of the system in this latent space. Now, one of the old problems of moving from rate networks to spike networks so the whole problem is that in some sense, we understand a lot how to compute in rate networks. Well, we understand some rate networks, but it's harder to move these insights from rate networks to spike networks. And the reason is in some sense that in rate networks, uh, neurons work in a depolarized regime. That means they get strong somatic input currents. 
and then also give a strong firing weight. So here we have a, a activation function of a neuron in a rate network, you know, it gets a strong input current, gives you a large firing weights. So this is how neurons work in standard deep networks, feed forward networks or uh, RNNs. However, in spiking networks in the brain, we know that neurons work in a balanced regime. So they work at threshold in some sense, they compute at threshold. And this has basically been figured out in the 90s. And it's been shown that neurons essentially fire spikes because of brief fluctuations in the balance between excitation and inhibition. And it's not entirely clear how to basically do uh, computation in these kind of networks. And so this is what I want to show we can actually do by taking this low rank perspective. All right. So let's look at this uh, network here that we had, which has this low rank connectivity. And I'm not showing the connectivity W anymore. I show it split into these encoders and ecoders D. And Y1, Y2 are the latent variables that we have. I'm also going to assume there's some kind of feed forward input that is shown here. Um, so we have this synaptic weight matrix with a rank constraint W equals ED. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that all the weights are negative for now. So this is just going to be an all inhibitor network that receives some feed forward excitatory input so that, you know, the neurons also spike. And then we assume it's a spiking network. It is going to be a bunch of leaky integrating fire neurons. So all the voltages basically have a spiking threshold. And if the voltages reach the threshold, the respective neuron spikes and resets, etc. So there's a simple geometric way of understanding these networks. And that works as follows. We simply have to look at the dynamics of these networks in the latent space. So I'm not trying to understand the dynamics in the fine rate space or the spike space, if you want, but in the latent space. So you have the latent variable y1, y2. And now let's look at just one neuron, for instance, this first neuron here, R1. So this neuron R1 is going to have a threshold, and that threshold, shown as the blue line here, divides the latent space into two half spaces, one in which the voltage is above threshold and one in which the voltage is below threshold. Now, the encoding weights of this neuron will determine the orientation of this threshold. The feed forward input together with uh, the threshold determines exactly the location of this threshold. Then the dynamics of these latents by default will be to just go to zero in the absence of spiking. So if no one is spiking, the latent variables will all be zero. And that is shown by these arrows in this plot. So the dynamics of the latents naturally is to go towards zero. However, eventually they will reach the threshold of this neuron and move from the sub-threshold to the super-threshold regime, in which case this neuron is going to fire a spike. If this neuron fires a spike, this spike is going to move in the direction of the decoding weights, the decoding vector of this neuron shown here, um, which basically moves in this direction shown here uh, in the direction of D1. So we can see that this neuron has a sort of dynamics in this uh, latent space. It'll simply leak towards zero, and then every time it reaches a threshold, it will bounce towards uh, the direction of D1. What's important to notice is I've actually, I'm only showing you a single integrating fire neuron here, just in a very weird way, because we look at its dynamics through this lens of the latent space. The advantage is that now we can do the same thing um, for another neuron, such as this R2 neuron. And if this neuron has a different set of encoding and decoding weights, then it'll be a different uh, threshold in this two-dimensional space, whose orientation, again, is given by the encoding weights, the position by thresholds and feedforward inputs, and the decoding uh, weights determines the direction of the arrow. If I now do this with many neurons, so a whole network, then I can see that together all of these neurons are going to form a boundary that is shown here. And each neuron is going to be active or responsible for one part of the boundary. And when that neuron gets hit, it's going to move the latent variable in the direction of its decoding vectors. Now I'm showing this here for two dimensions. Um, uh, but let me summarize first, actually. So to summarize this, what I'm basically showing is we can take this weight matrix of an integrated fire network, break it up, uh, make it low rank, and break it up into an encoder and decoder matrix. And then this encoder 
matrix E together with the feedforward input determines exactly the uh, position of all of these neural thresholds and thereby this boundary, whereas the decoding matrix D determines all of these arrows that now sit at this boundary. Okay, so, and the decoding matrix D together with the leak of the latent variables determines the dynamics. Notice that the leak of the latent variables in the integrated fire network simply corresponds to the leak, to the voltage leak. We can do this in 2D, we can also do it in 3D. If we do it in three dimensions, so for rank three networks, we get three latent variables. So here you see Y1, Y2, Y3. And then the boundary is here now illustrated as a sort of two dimensional manifold, where each patch on these manifolds corresponds to the neuron that is active for exactly that location of the latent variables. Of course, in reality, all these neurons are uh, planes in this three-dimensional space, but I'm only showing the part of the uh, boundary where a neuron is active, otherwise it will look too messy. Okay, if you're lost by now, don't worry, because at this point I just like to show a movie to give you some intuition of how we can understand the dynamics in a network like this. So here we have a network of 64 neurons. It's an all inhibitory integrated fire network and it's designed to simply generate a limit cycle um, for simplicity. So here on the left hand side you see the latents y1, y2, y3. Um, I'm plotting the latents y1, y2 against time on this empty plot on the upper right and the spikes of the neurons on the empty plot on the lower right against time. Um, the limit cycle is for the dimensions y1, y2, y3 is here just kept as a dummy dimension. And I'm not going to show a movie and ho hope it works for everyone that's going to show uh, how this network works. So we're going to see the trajectory of the latent, the dynamics of the latent, the state of the latents. that's the black uh, trajectory. And you're going to see that every time all the time the latents are trying to move towards the origin of the coordinate system, uh, zero, which is somewhere up here. Um, but then they can't go there because they've hit one of the thresholds. And when they hit a threshold of one of the neurons, that neuron is going to fire. And through its firing, it is going to move um, the latent variables in the direction of its decoding vector. And while it is doing that, you can now see the latents y1 and y2 over time and you see that they in fact create this sort of uh, limit cycle type oscillation and on the lower plot you see the neurons that spiked not all of the neurons were active only some of the neurons participated in this particular simulation and they spiked just once they have a very sparse spike in code to generate that limit cycle so why is it important so first of all it's sort of nice to illustrate because you can literally see the vector field created by these neurons and the dynamics that follows this vector field. You have to take into account though that it's not just the decoding vectors that determine the dynamics but the decoding vectors together with the leak. The next thing that I want to point out is that this system is special in the sense that it is robust to the loss of some of its neurons. So for instance, if you now kill a neuron at this particular location, so I take my network of 64 neurons and I kill exactly one neuron. Then what's going to happen is that the other neurons are automatically filling in um, that patch of the boundary for the simple reason that each neuron of course is a full plane and what I'm showing you is only where they touch the boundary. If I kill another neuron that neuron is simply going to disappear but the neighboring neurons are going to fill in. I can in Indeed, just kill 25% of the neurons randomly and I get a more patchy boundary. But I think what may already be clear somewhat visually is that this does not actually affect the dynamics of the network. So if I now simulate the network again, you can see that it still performs the limit cycle. And the simple reason is that neurons that are neighboring to the neurons that got lost, you know, had somewhat similar decoding vectors. Uh, so there's some redundancy in the network and this redundancy allows for the compensation of uh, the loss of neurons. And it's not perfect, so it's not you know exactly the same as the uh, old network, but it's pretty close uh, 
to what the 64 neural network did. And this, of course, is very different from sort of a standard recurrent neural network where you cannot just, you know, that you may be trained, for instance, you cannot just kill 25% of the neurons randomly and expect the network to still operate. Now, what I hope uh, has become clear is that if we have a system like this with our 64 neurons and these decoding vectors, you know, that are shown in black here determine the dynamics, then of course we can pretty much map any dynamical system onto the boundary. So here I have a limit cycle, but I could also just design a bistable system. So you now see a, a, a flow field, or it's not really a flow field, but the, you see the decoding vectors that converge onto fixed points here and here. Um, I can also do something uh, different. I can, for instance, do a ring attractor. For a ring attractor, the decoding vectors need to point outwards. And so you have to do a bit of brain gymnastics now because you have to imagine that the actual flow field is the decoding vectors plus the leak. And I'm not showing the leak. I'm only showing the decoding vectors. But if the decoding vectors oppose the leak, which is what they're doing right now, they're opposing the leak, then when they're exactly equal to the leak, you get fixed points. And so in this case, you would get a ring of fixed points around here. But anyways, uh, the point is just to say by changing the direction of the decoding vectors, we can pretty much map any two-dimensional dynamic systems onto this boundary. Another important uh, idea, though, is, of course, the way this whole space here is tessellated. So currently, these encoding vectors E determine uh, the different positions of these neurons on this boundary. And of course, we can change that. We can change the tessellation and put and, and make it such that, for instance, there's an unequal distribution of the encoding vectors. And oops, Allah, that was not what I wanted to show. There's an unequal distribution of the encoding vectors. And up here on the upper left, we have now a very high density of neurons. So we get a high precision for our dynamical system. And here on the lower right, we have only a few neurons, so we'll have a low precision for our dynamical system. Of course, we don't necessarily need uh, a square grid. We can also just, for instance, choose a circular geometry. And so here I choose 12 neurons that are, are uh, aligned on a circle, and then the tessellation is uh, circular. Um, and then what is important is that such a circular, uh, that such, these arrangements of encoding vectors then determine for which values of the latent variables, the neurons become active. So in some sense, you could say they determine the neurons tuning curves. So for instance, here, uh, I have this sort of limit cycle system. And here I'm plotting you the when the neurons are becoming active as a function of the of the angle between y1 and y2. And you should notice that here in this simulation, I added noise because otherwise, it's a deterministic system, not so good for computing a tuning curve. But if we add noise, the neurons will become active, you know, at different points on the circle. And that is shown by this set of tuning curves. But if we now change the tessellation of the space, the arrangement of the space, then of course, you know, the tuning curves will broaden for these areas that are, you know, very, um, where there are only a few neurons active and they will become more overlapping for these areas where there are lots of neurons active. Now, what is important is that these tessellations change the tuning curves of the neurons. So when neurons are becoming active for different parts of the latent space, but such tessellation can also just change through threshold changes. So you don't need to change the encoding vectors to change the tessellation of the latent space. So for instance, here I have the same system and all I'm doing is I'm now changing the thresholds randomly. So I'm changing the thresholds of the neurons randomly. The connectivity of the network stays exactly the same. Uh, so no change in the connectivity, just a random diffusion, if you want, of the thresholds or potentially of feedforward inputs that would be mathematically equivalent. And what you can see is, in such a case, there will be neurons that sort of drop in uh, or drop out, but they don't change the functionality of the network. So in all of these cases, we get our limit cycle back. It's not going to change very much. Um, but neurons are going to drop in or out without changing the functionality. And um, so we suggest, and I'm going to show more examples of this later on, that could be a mechanism for representational drift. So the fact that neurons you know, drop in or out over uh, the timescale of days as observed in uh, various brain areas, 
or potentially even that they change their tuning over long time scales. So it doesn't require any kind of synaptic plasticity to have that. It simply requires some changes in the threshold or effective threshold of the neurons. Um, so let me summarize what we've seen so far. So I've basically shown you that we can take an all inhibitory integrated fire network, uh, give it a low rank constraint, so that factorizes the weight matrix W into these encoders and decoders. Um, and then once we have this factorization, we can visualize it. So we can show that the encoders together with the feed forward inputs, or the thresholds in some sense, cause this uh, convex boundary and also determine the tessellation. So how neurons exactly are aligned along this convex boundary. Whereas the decoders together with the voltage leak give rise to a dynamic system that sort of hovers or moves around uh, along this convex boundary. Now, this inhibitory population is stable in the sense that the dynamics in the latent space is always attracted to the boundary. So the boundary acts as, an, as a global attractor of the dynamics, and then the dynamics hovers around the boundary. Of course, one thing that I guess many of you may wonder is, well, but what about excitatory neurons? So it turns out we can do exactly the same mathematics also on excitatory neurons. And if we do that, we get a sign flip. So an all excitatory population also creates a boundary, also creates a decoder, decoders that we can, you know, move along the boundary. But the dynamics of this boundary is now unstable. So the boundary repels the dynamics. So here we see that the leak moves away from the boundary, and when a neuron fires, which is shown by these uh, arrows that correspond to the decoding vectors, it moves us further into the sub -th super threshold regime. So the population is unstable and explodes. Of course, that is not very useful, but an excitatory population can be stabilized to inhibitory population, and that brings us to excitatory inhibitory networks, and that is shown here. So uh, I have to uh, so here, for instance, I show now the excitatory activity of um, of the excitatory population, so one latent variable, the inhibitory activity of the uh, inhibitory population, one latent variable. Notice that I now reduced from four latent variables to two latent variables, so I'll be able to show it. Um, and what you can see is the boundaries of the two populations. So the blue one is the boundary of the blue population, the red one is the boundary of the red population, of the excitatory population. Um, and what uh, this is supposed to show is that the excitatory population is unstable, the inhibitory population is stable, and therefore we get basically inhibition stabilized network in which the excitatory dynamics is going to drive the excitatory latents to go to infinity, uh, but the inhibitory activity is going to catch that and bring the latent states back into the subthreshold regime. And so we get this sort of classical oscillation into a fixed point from excited inhibitor populations. So this is a very classical plot of EI networks, but the interpretation has changed because these blue and red lines now are not null clients, they are the boundaries that are made up of many neurons. Um, and at the intersection of this boundary, uh, for larger networks, we get stable, asynchronous, and irregular activity, such as in classical balanced networks. We can also use this to perform some simple computations. So use the fact that we have both excited inhibitor networks to think about computation even in a different way. And I just want to, you know, briefly illustrate that. Um, so, so far, I've basically shown you how to think about the dynamics in these latent spaces. But we have not talked much about the external inputs, except to say that they determine the position of these boundaries. And this is now more explicitly shown on the right-hand side, where we have the inhibitory latent, the excitatory latent, and down in the third dimension, I'm showing you the external input that uh, is fed into the network. And we see that the external input can now shift these boundaries around in such a way that the fixed point changes and becomes a function of this external input. And since these boundaries are generally convex, we can show mathematically that this intersection is generally the difference between two convex functions. The difference between two convex functions, of course, is any kind of function. 
So we can do universal function approximation with basically um, EI networks. So here, for instance, I'm showing you how to approximate a simple function. Here's the input x. This is the output y. It's a simple zigzag function with only six neurons. So here we take three excitatory neurons, three inhibitor neurons. These are the boundaries of these neurons. We have the excitatory boundary, the inhibitory boundary, and the white line is the intersection of the boundary. And you see that as a function of the input x, you can already see that the intersection becomes a zigzaggy function. And just a short it's... reminder, uh, you have two minutes left now. I have two minutes left now. OK, yes. so it's a bit less than I thought, but OK, it's fine. Um, and so we can simulate this. And we see that if we provide this input x over time with our six neuron system, three neuron, three inhibition, three excitatory neurons, we can basically create this zigzag function. And this is the spike raster of these neurons. Um, so these are, of course, all toy models. And um, what will be interesting to see, can we scale it up? Can we scale it up to much larger system? So one possibility is to fix the rank and increase the number of neurons. That's mathematically possible and easy, uh, not easy, but mathematically possible. And, uh, uh, but it's biologically unrealistic. So what we really need to do is we need to increase both the rank and the number of neurons. Um, and this becomes a bit more complicated because our, the, our geometric intuitions for these low D systems don't generalize so much into high D. Um, so this, for instance, is a convex boundary in high D where you can see that uh, we get these strong vertices. And in fact, the dynamics is now going to move along these vertices where different neurons intersect. And that means we get systems where many neurons are going to be active at the same time, not just one neuron, which is also more realistic, but harder to understand. And one case that we understand very well is the symmetric case uh, where we have sparse coding. Um, and I'm going to skip this. And the other uh, case that we understand, that we are starting to understand, is the non-symmetric case. And this is the uh, also what Bill is going to talk about in the next in the next uh, talk. So to summarize this, um, I made one key assumption, which is that we consider low rank connectivity and uh, excited to inhibitory populations separately. I showed you that this low rank connectivity generates dynamics in a in a latent space in a low dimensional latent space. And we can look at the dynamics of integrated fire networks in this latent space. And we can show that it evolves along a convex boundary for an inhibitory network or along the intersection of two boundaries for an excitatory inhibitory network. And I've shown you that networks are robust against neuron loss and can potentially account for phenomena such as representational drift. And I also point out some literature. Some of the stuff is published but some of the stuff uh, we hope to uh, publish uh, uh, soon. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the really nice talk. Very interesting. Um, so there are a lot of questions, and um, I'm just going to read them out. Um, the first one is by Nosra Tula. And um, so Great talk. I guess you're kind of forcing the low dimensional dynamics on the network. Is it possible to infer the low dimensional dynamics directly from fitting the RNN? Um, we are forcing low dimensional dynamics through um, the low rank connectivity. That is true. Um, what was the second part of the question? Sorry, I didn't get it. Is it possible to infer the low rank? Uh, dy low dimensional dynamics directly from fitting the RNN. To infer the low rank dynamics from fitting the RNN. So we're not doing any fitting, but I guess if you wanted to fit an RNN, you could fit it under a long low rank constraint. Um, on the other hand, if you had a system that low dimensional dynamics, maybe the RNN would find a low rank solution, although that is not necessarily clear to me whether that's true. So I guess we're going to the next question. This is uh, from Friedemann. Um, is there an optimal encoding strategy, like the tessellation in the presence of noise? And in which case do neurons collapse or to the same tuning curve? Or is it always beneficial to have slightly different tuning curves? Well, that is an excellent question and uh, a nice PhD project. 
Um, well, I don't. I don't really know. I guess my intuition would be that the tessellation can be optimized, just as it's optimized in standard efficient coding strategies, right? And it will depend on the noise. Um, so the more noise you put into the network, uh, the less important it will be to optimize uh, to tessellate optimally. The more deterministic the system is, the more important it may be to tessellate optimally. I mean, mm -hmm. these are just my intuitions. But I would just say that goes completely into this whole literature on efficient coding, how to, you know, optimally tessellate sensory spaces and things like this. So I think yeah. that would just translate into these uh, uh, spike in neural networks. Yeah. And did you see that they, they collapse to the same tuning curve or in which cases would they do this? When would they collapse to the same tuning curve? So. I think in our way of thinking about it, they would never collapse to exactly the same tuning curve. Okay. There would always be some heterogeneity. Yeah, okay. So then the next question is from Arash. Um, why do nearby, or whatever that means, neurons have similar decoding values? So what are nearby neurons? And um, does this constraint come from biology? Sorry, I don't, I don't think I understood the question. Can you read it again? Yeah. So why do nearby neurons have similar decoding values? Huh. OK, yes, um, that is by assumption. So it does not have to be designed this way. If they don't have uh, similar decoding values, then obviously the network is not going to be robust against neural loss. So you can say that is a specific example where I wanted to show something. I just wanted to show that you know if nearby neurons do similar things, when nearby means nearby in the latent, latent space, then you have this robustness against neural loss. But you're right. The system can also be set up in such a way that the decoding vectors of nearby neurons are very different, and then you don't have robustness against neural loss. So, um, and the second part of the question was, does this constraint fr come from biology? But then I guess this was just an assumption well, you did. Yeah, this is, I mean, I guess my summary is a little bit sloppy or the way I said it is a bit sloppy. So it's a very good question. Um, I would say there are biological systems that have no redundancy. There are systems in the insects where we sort of insect world where we know there's no redundancy. Uh, I guess in systems like cortex, we would sort of assume there's redundancy in the sense that, you know, you can knock out systems and things still kind of work. Um, it's maybe still an empirical question to sort of see how much real redundancy there is. It's something that's experimentally also very hard to test um, because you need to test against all possible, you know, directions of sensory input, motor outputs, etc. Um, it's really just my biological intuition. My biological intuition is that networks should be on average robust against the loss of neurons, just as the liver is robust against loss of liver cells and the kidney is robust against loss of kidney cells and so it's just a biological intuition if you want yeah. okay then the next question is again from friedemann and he asked um does the ei network you showed and its operating point formally coincide with balance network meaning the the one over square root of k scaling that's a scaling question um so there are different types of balanced networks uh so there's you know Loser balance, tighter balance, super tight balance, etc. Uh, and usually, when people talk about balanced networks, they talk about networks with random connectivity. So whether we reach that regime is not one hundred percent clear because we usually don't have random connectivity, and random connectivity is also not strictly speaking low rank. But if you take a slightly more pragmatic view and just say, well, balance is if input currents are balanced, okay, then yes, uh, in the limit where you have a high redundancy, you do uh, reach the balance regime, but it's, it's the tightly balanced regime of Alfonso Renard and others, not the sort of loosely balanced regime of uh, von Rieswick and Sempolinsky. Okay, so then um, we have another question from Alex, and um, the question is, how would the decision boundaries look with nonlinear neurons, like the Itzikiewicz uh, dynamics? Oh, well, that is also a great question for a project. Um, I don't really know. So um, one could sort of imagine that, you know, if, if you have more complicated neuron models, it's going to make the boundary look differently. OK, it may also be possible if the neural model is too complicated that the boundary by itself becomes not a useful way of looking 
at an integrating fire network. So for instance, one of the, let me give like a simple example. So for instance, if you change the reset of a neuron, um, you make it larger or smaller, for instance, of an integrating fire neuron, we can sort of say, well, that is going to make the boundary move of every neuron, right? Every time the neuron sort of resets, its threshold is going to move around. So that's one way of visualizing it, okay. But if you start having more and more knobs, then the boundary itself becomes dynamic, for instance, like if you have hidden dynamics, etc. And when the boundary itself becomes dynamic, then this nice separation between the static boundary and the latent space dynamics disappears. And I would say, may this be that the boundary then is not a useful way of looking at what the network is doing. I think one should just think about it as a tool to understand what the network is doing. And, you know, if you twist it too much in different directions, it is not going to be so worthwhile as a tool anymore. Thanks. And then we have one last question from Friedemann. And he asked, um, other than redundancy, what are the key advantages of such a recurrent network that um, is inhibition stabilized over a feed forward network? And deep nets in AI seem to do well without inhibition stabilization. That is also an excellent question. Um, and uh, and to be honest, I think it's a very deep question. I don't really have the answer. It's like one of the things I'm interested in is literally why are systems set up like this? Why are they set up at this sort of unstable? Uh, yeah, in this at this at this point where you have one boundary is unstable, the other one is stable. It's kind of like a dangerous point because you know kind of epilepsy, and so things can go wrong. But there must be a computational advantage. So I think we have you know, some loose ideas that it could have something to do with the speed of processing, with the ability to amplify things, things like this. Um, but I don't think we have a very deep understanding of what the advantage of this particular architecture is. One thing I would bet on, though, is that it has an advantage. Okay. Um, and then I guess since we have one last minute, I guess I can ask um, a question also. Um, and I was wondering for um, this tes tessellation that you have, what, do you think it's possible to have like an adaptive version of it to um, basically enhance precision in, in part of the dynamic where it's currently more needed or would this make sense? Yes, you could actually. So that's a good idea. We haven't thought about that. So an adaptive version could be generated by just changing the thresholds of the neurons. So by changing the thresholds, you may be able to um, put more neurons in one part of the space uh, and then, you know, change that online. But to be more flexible, you eventually would want to change the encoding weights to change the tessellation. And that would require synaptic plasticity um, to do so. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and thank you again for your great talk. I think we now um, have to move on to William Podlaski's talk and um, see you all in the next um, talk. Okay.